Hello, good afternoon, good morning, and uh, good evening around the world for whoever uh, dialed into this. Welcome to our third installment uh, of our Healthcare Insider series. We started this, I guess, uh, nine months ago uh, with a discussion around COVID-19, uh, the pandemic, uh, vaccination programs. We then had a very interesting session uh, last time with our CEO around digital transformation uh, and what IHH is doing in the course of digital transformation. How much are we going to invest? And today I have here a couple of uh, my colleagues and uh, uh, from Hong Kong we have uh, uh, Michael Dennis, uh, the Managing Director uh, of the Alternative Strategy and Capital Markets Investments of uh, BlackRock. Uh, and we're going to discuss about our laboratories business and about uh, diagnostics and what the diagnostics business is here for uh, uh, our industry. Before we get started, before I introduce uh, the colleagues, we have an art test. You did your art test, uh, Ashok? Yes, I did my ART test this morning, yeah. And, and, it, and it did show on the, uh, I think it needs to show on the C. And it is all clear. So. Okay, I, I did my art test. I think we reported it to uh, our HR function. That's why we can sit here without a mask. Uh, uh, before we get started, Gong Shi Fa Tsai, everyone, uh, Happy New Year of the Tiger. I hope everyone had a great time. Do you, you went somewhere or you stayed here in, in, in Singapore? I was here in Singapore with the family. We, we had a relaxing time, went around Chinatown, looked, looked and the decorations were, were absolutely beautiful. Uh, so yes, we had a very, very relaxing time here. Perfect, great. So uh, let, let's introduce uh, the colleagues here on the panel. So first of all, um, uh, Ashok Pandit, uh, our uh, Group Chief Strategy and Business Development Officer and the head uh, and lead of our laboratories initiative uh, for the whole group. Welcome, Ashok. Thank you. Uh, we have Dr. Daniel Tan. He is dialing in today from Palo Alto in Stanford, where uh, he meets some of his old uh, uh, friends from university. Uh, Daniel is the Chief Executive Officer of Parkway Laboratories. Hi, Daniel. Hello. We have, uh, right from KL, uh, Maud Harif bin Muhammad, Chief Executive Officer of Pantai Premier Pathology. Uh, hi, Harif, and I think you lead a market leading uh, a business uh, uh, for us. We'll come to that in a minute. And Michael, I've introduced you already. Uh, you are the managing director, head of alternatives, uh, strategy, and capital markets in Asia Pacific. Hi, Michael. And for, for the benefit of everyone, Michael is not uh, uh, just a strategic. Uh, uh, head or a strategic function. He is actually running his own portfolio within uh, uh, BlackRock, so we have real investment expertise here on the panel. Now, let me introduce the topic, uh, how diagnostics is about diagnostics. Diagnostics uh, is something we've started to talk about a little bit last year in our analyst uh, uh, presentations, analyst sessions. It has moved from the basement of our business, where actually many of our labs are in, in the basement of hospitals. And it has moved from the basement to the ground floor. There's a little bit more visibility, especially during this pandemic, we talked uh, to you about earnings contribution in our earnings calls, great margins uh, that this business had. We want to talk about what the future of this business is uh, and what potential growth potential it has for uh, IHH. Now, before we jump to the first uh, uh, audience question, uh, I want to encourage uh, everyone who dialed in um, to leave questions. Uh, we're going to come to a Q&A session uh, a little bit uh, later, and uh, I'll have them here on my chat box. Uh, please actively participate, and I will remind you uh, in the course of this. Now, let's get to the first question. Uh, how many of you 
uh, here have taken a lab test in the past year and it is a uh, an audience question so everyone please uh, give your answers we have here already 50 uh, 70 80 100 uh, participants and I think there is a very clear trend most of you uh, have participated in some kind of test but there's still around 10 percent uh, of the audience who have not had uh, tests done or have not gone to any lab uh, uh, tests but it already shows and I want to direct this to you Ashok it already shows testing laboratory business that has something uh, in the market or there is a new trend where lab business is more prominent how, how do you see this I think thanks, Jörg. I think uh, if, if, I, if I look through the journey the labs have gone through in the, the last two or three years, it's, it's been an absolute transformation of, of the business. And labs have been big contributors. They, are a, they play a key role in healthcare services, as you know. And for a group like IHH, they, they present a, a, a huge opportunity. I think what also, you know, one needs to also take into account that uh, what are the themes, what are the themes that have got the, the, the lab business now so much into focus and, you know, some of the things that you, you, we, we, we've talked about in your previous uh, discussion as well, COVID has been one key theme. But the other themes which are really putting the labs right in front uh, for everyone to think are themes like wellness, uh, preventative uh, you know, medicine. We all want are, are a little bit more be careful about our health, want to, want to see how we are doing, and labs play a key and important role. The other factors that are, that, are, that are really contributing to the growth are things like digitalization, which has provided accessibility, data, AI. And I think these are the factors, like you said, they, they are moving the labs from the basement to the ground floor and becoming you know, more prominent. And for, for a group like IHH, this, this presents a, a, a very, very unique sort of opportunity. I think in the next three to five years, we're gonna see the lab sector growing in a very strong manner. And I think IHH is uniquely positioned given our current platforms to really take advantage of this growth in the sector. Now, I'm, I'm not sure how many people are aware, but we are market leaders in our core markets. So when it comes to Singapore with Parkway Laboratories, or when it comes to Malaysia with Pantai Premier, or Turkey with LabMed, or SRL in India, we are leaders in our markets. We've been present in some of these markets for over 30 years. Like PLS got established in 1991. So we have the experience, we have the history, and, and, and we are well positioned now to take advantage uh, of the growth that this particular sector is going to see. So me as a consumer, what, what services can I buy from you? What, what services are you offering uh, to me as a consumer or maybe to my doctor who uh, uh, I'm consulting with? So, you know, starting with a very basic test and you know tests that a lot of people are very familiar with right now would be a COVID test. Uh, so COVID test, basic blood test, a very highly advanced high-end test like genetic testing or you know molecular diagnostics. The labs offer a whole spectrum of tests which are useful in, in day-to-day -day sort of analysis of our, our own sort of health. And the way we think about our healthcare. Mm. What is fueling that? Is it technological advancement? Is it a higher awareness that people have to be hygienic or be tested, or, or is it both? Or how do you see that? So, so multiple factors uh, are leading to the growth. Like I said, you know, COVID has, has definitely played a big role. And then, as people think about wellness, as people become a lot more aware of their own health. Testing has now, has really evolved from where it was three, five years ago to where it is now. And I think what, what we'll see is this trend only increasing as we partner 
with with the doctors and as 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 patients and, and consumers g get a lot more you know, conscious about their own health and they want to track their own health going forward. Let me turn the question to Harif uh, in, in KL. Harif, we, we, we have this image of coming from the basement in, into the ground floor. Uh, what has changed for you as the leader of that, of that uh, Pantai Premier business? Thanks, Joe. <laughs> yes, uh, indeed, uh, the assault of a COVID pandemic has really changed things significantly for us. Uh, and it has been both uh, challenging as well as exciting for us. Uh, we liken ourselves to be the people behind the scenes, uh, the one that make the doctors look good. Uh, but the scale of the pandemic over the years uh, have changed this dramatically. Uh, everyone is talking about testing, People on the street is discussing about molecular tests, about PCR, about CT values, about variants. And the role of the lab is now at the front line. Uh, so, yes, we are now at the front line, but we have taken things within our stride, actually. And it is like a calling for us um, and a call of duty. You See, have, Pantai Premier Patron, yes. You have, if I, let me just jump in here. We, you have told us in the, in the pre-discussions uh, to this, you have some special, special capabilities that you've built up in your laboratory and where you are like a, like a reference laboratory, uh, maybe even beyond Malaysia. Can, can you share a little bit about that? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, see, Panda Premier Pathology is one of the pioneers for molecular testing locally. Uh, we established our cytogenetic and molecular lab uh, since 2016. And we pride ourselves as uh, a very comprehensive molecular lab serving in the area of infectious disease, oncology, and fetal maternal diagnostic, offering cytogenetic karyotyping, molecular PCR, and even now, uh, next generation sequencing. So going back to the COVID uh, experience, when the Ministry of Health Malaysia asked us, uh, the private sector to come on board to assist the nation in screening for COVID uh, way back in February 2020, uh, we enrolled willingly. Uh, to date, uh, we have performed uh, more than 2.3 million tests of RT-PCR nationwide, contributing to about 8% of the national testing capacity. On the other hand, uh, our role within IAH itself is also very important. Uh, we balance the ecosystem and supporting our hospital to ensure safety of our people and the patients. And our labs uh, is supporting the IAH group of hospital to provide screening for pre-procedure and pre-admission timely and in-house where possible. So going back to your question about uh, well, how do we do this and what do we have is that uh, we adopt technology uh, very fast. We not only adopt, we adapt and then we advance our capability uh, to provide services to ensure that uh, our partners are the first in the market in terms of new technologies, procedures and modality. How do you how do you do that? How do you stay at the forefront of technology? I mean, I, I, I can imagine this is one of the most important things to stay really at the forefront of science. How do you do that? So basically, uh, number one, uh, we have to identify ourselves with partners. So, for example, uh, when we see there's a technology, we also ensure that our partners are willing to partner with us uh, and provide that technology. Um, so for, for that, uh, we ensure that uh, our services are of quality and uh, we also empower our people to upscale their capa capability um, uh, in providing the services. I'll give you an example. Um, when we started our, our molecular lab in 2016, uh, we are one of the first lab in Malaysia to provide companion diagnostic testing 
uh, for oncology, for targeted therapy. And at that time, uh, this testing is not uh, freely available. So uh, we partner with our vendors and they are willing to place uh, instrumentations in our lab as long as we have a dedicated uh, scientists to run the systems. Uh, and at the same time, we work with pharmaceutical companies uh, in providing uh, affordable testing, whereby uh, together with them, uh, they sponsored this testing uh, for, for patients. And now, uh, starting early last year, we already have capability in doing next generation sequencing whereby uh, we do uh, comprehensive genetic profiling for cancer patients uh, to look at alterations that help doctors uh, in identifying which uh, route of treatment is uh, most appropriate for, for the patients. Wow, that, that's, that's like super scientific, uh, sounds like a lot of investment, sounds like a lot of effort to stay really at that technological forefront. Let me, let me switch gears and, and, and go back to Daniel. Daniel, coming out on the ground floor, being uh, having your own shop front, that changes the work of a CEO. How, how did this change affect your personal work environment and the challenges that you face as a CEO of this business? Well, well, thanks, York, for, for giving us the, the airtime. For, for the longest time, labs have always been considered the backroom support for front uh, frontline services like the, the clinics, the hospitals itself. And we are usually like what you call the supporting cast in the big movie. And we are the, the props men, the makeup artists, etc., that helps the actors at the front look good. But the, the lab has always been really the, the key to getting the diagnosis of the patients correct. And that's what we've always been doing in terms of sharpening that tool. Because the accuracy of the results actually determines the treatment pathways that the doctors are going to make. And also helps to alleviate the anxieties of the patient as to what's wrong with them when they come through the front door, be it the clinic or the hospitals itself. So our task is really to get that results quickly, uh, effortlessly, and of course, mostly, most important, accurately to the clinicians itself. How has that changed over the years? Um, obviously, similar to what Harish mentioned, the tools that we're using today are very different. Uh, it's been evolving exponentially. Uh, thanks a lot to not just the hardware, but also the software. With it, and I think you alluded to it, uh, and Ashok alluded to it. It's using big data, and so it is not just a, a single test result, but basically what we can do now is to aggregate multiple test results together to give the entire picture of what's happening to the patient. Important to note also is that when you come into the hospital for your diagnosis, it is just a snapshot of what's happening to you at that very moment. But actually, as you all know, and as we all know, our illness is not a snapshot. It is really a timeline of illnesses where they're aggregated together. So it is how do we combine the, da the data from our past results to today's results. And that's actually giving us the most important thing, which is trending. Where is your health heading? Is your health heading in the good direction or is it heading in a negative direction so that's the sort of new toolbox that we're using today to help bring all this together that sounds like a, a lot of data analytics uh, ai and, and I'm, I'm sure we'll 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 talk about that uh, in a minute let's let's ask michael as as one of the uh, or as a as an investment practitioner here who uh, uh, hears all this with fascination, I'm sure, but in the end you invest in businesses and you want to make money with it. Uh, w w what are some of the trends that you see uh, in this healthcare space? What are you investing in uh, as, as BlackRock? 
Yeah, thanks very much. And thanks again for the invite today. It's great to be here. Um, and by the way, I love Daniel's uh, analogy of the health trend, because that's certainly something that uh, we think about, because the three factors we're really looking at within healthcare are number one is healthcare ecosystems versus single vertical and the value of that ecosystem. And we're looking at that by country, by region. And how do you look when you look across hospitals, pharmacy, diagnostics? How do you see within a brand or within a company that there's ecosystem value that is going to be benefit both the company as an investor, you're looking at um, underlying financials, but also for patients. Um, I think that's number one as a theme. I think number two is um, really in kind of consumer preferences in the way that they are interacting with healthcare. I think this goes to Daniel's point on the, on the healthcare trend or the health trend is that before there was adopters who would prevent or proactively get additional tests, check their DNA for underlying health concerns. You're now seeing due to the rise of technology um, and also because of the changes in corporate insurance or healthcare insurance, you're now seeing people's behavior being moved towards a much more preventative culture around, um, around healthcare and particularly in the use of labs. And I think this is critical because you've now got this what will become over time much more um, kind of the norm is to understand your underlying health you want the picture of your underlying health as an individual and how you can prevent that going forward and, and Ashok mentioned that earlier when you add wellness in there as well this is going to be a huge driver that we're really looking at as an investment trend and then finally the third one is really the use of data and technology I think when you look at other sectors so we look at consu consumer for example with uh, food delivery or in um, e-commerce, which has obviously taken huge strides versus offline retail, the implementation of technology and digitization in all aspects of healthcare, I think has a huge opportunity given the imp importance of healthcare to all of us in our everyday lives. And I think that we've only really scratched the surface of what technology can bring to the table in different areas. And as was touched on earlier, that can either be on the scientific side that can be on the engagement with patient side, that can be in the engagement of the healthcare industry. But the embedded benefits there of far greater use of technology and digitization, um, I think it is really exciting. And so when you put those three together as structural trends within the industry, added to factors such as COVID, added to factors such as changing regulatory framework in, in certain countries, um, and also to the changing use of capital or the growth of private capital in the healthcare segment, you've got ultimately six different factors there that are really going to change the outlook on key areas such as labs in the years to come. Do, do you have a, a dedicated healthcare fund or do you have capital allocated to uh, healthcare investments? So we have multiple. So because we believe that then when you think about a healthcare ecosystem, that means that there's multiple parts of the journey um, that as investors, that there's going to be opportunity. So we have both biotech funds, we have healthcare and wellness, private equity funds. Um, we have healthcare innovation funds that really focus on biotech, medtech, um, and kind of capturing that theme that I talked about. But I think what's important to note is in, in some of our more generalist funds, the, the kind of breadth of opportunities within the healthcare sector to invest in are now far broader or becoming broader than they have been historically. And so what you're seeing is the allocation to healthcare as an overall sector increasing with the increase in the number of underlying pillars or subsectors, as we would refer to it, um, is expanding and that the growth and investment opportunity is therefore changing. So I think in, in answer to your question, we've got both dedicated, but also a growing allocation from more generalist pools of capital given how quickly the investment opportunity is evolving. Do, do you see, I mean, you talked about three capabilities or three trends or three main uh, uh, drivers here. Do you see companies out there who are actually capable of addressing those three aspects or those various aspects? I mean, it seems there are a lot more requirements where maybe in the past it was much more about medical science and medical expertise or clinical expertise. It's now a, a lot more features that you address. Are there companies out there who you see uh, as really being able to address those or is there still more work required to build know-how? So I think there's two ways to answer that. There's the, as an investor, I'm trying to understand how do I get exposure to something? 
And at the moment, the there is a limited opportunity set of the kind of all-in-one player who is capturing the whole ecosystem. So for an investment strategy, we've had to capture that by investing in innovative biotech companies or in e-medicine. Um, or uh, as a complement to an existing position potentially in the hospital sector. And so what we've seen is that you've seen a quite fast growth of unicorns in the online healthcare segment, in particular markets such as China and in India, um, which I think has educated a lot of the investor base of what the opportunity set is and also what the constituent parts of a successful business will be. What I think is interesting is for established brands such as companies such as IHH, there's actually an opportunity to learn from those companies that may have been operating in a, in a particular vertical or um, in a particular more tech orientated segment to then given the strength of a brand such as IHH and the embedded health expertise to, um, to take on some of those key factors within the business model is going to enable investors such as, such as ourselves to be able to gain a, a much broader exposure and a more complete long-term package to a solution that maybe currently we can only capture by taking a fragmented investment approach to capture those different trends. Um, the one I would call out from a global perspective, where we've seen evidence of this kind of online offline ecosystem being sewn together is really Kaiser Group in the US. We have started to see the benefits coming through in different verticals that they've been able to blend the two of online and offline to really improve both company and, um, and particular patient outcomes. So if I understand you correctly, partnering uh, along the value chain, partnering even with uh, people from other industries and other technologies will become a much more important aspect to address all this. L let me, w w one of the things I, I, that struck me just now, Daniel, from what you said, uh, you feel you had been a, a support staff uh, in a movie and and but now you're actually turning into the lead actor in a in a completely different movie and let me let me ask you around changi airport you you, you won projects in changi airport it's a very different skill set required compared to how you run a hospital how, how, so how did you how do you win this uh, changi airport deal so i think for for our listeners uh, if you do get the, the chance to visit Singapore. Uh, one of the requirements presently is that when you land in Singapore, you need a PCR test on arrival, uh, which will be swapped at the airport. Uh, soon after you get your bags, you have to walk to this little swabbing place. And we are not the swabber, but we are the, the partway laboratories is the lab that's running all the PCR tests uh, for uh, COVID tests on arrivals. And I'm happy to, to do a shout out that we'll get your results back to you within six hours if it's a negative result with it. How do we get this? I, I think it's really because we are trusted uh, in terms of having the most experience with running PCR tests. We're the first private lab that started PCR testing in Singapore. And today, I think we can say that we are the leader in terms of the volume of tests that we've done. We've done over 2. 4 million PCR tests since COVID started. So with that breadth of experience, we've actually got ourselves running a very efficient ship. And that's how we can get the, the swaps run through and results back to you within six hours, if it's negative. I, I say if it's negative, because if it's positive, we'll do a rerun. And as, and as I emphasize, we want to make sure that if it's positive, it's truly positive. It's not a false positive. So we're going to do it a second time round to make sure that it is back to you in terms of full accuracy. So that's actually trust. And that's all the ethos of the IHH brand that we were able to get to our external clients, in this case, Changi Airport, to sort of say, use us and we're going to be your most trusted lab partner. Today, I think we can say, and whoever's come through Changi, I think you will be able to validate your experience that you're getting the results very fast from us. And if you don't get there within six uh, hours, don't, don't get a heart attack. You still have a second chance <laughs> for the test yeah. rerun. <laughs> Let us, uh, uh, please, for the audience, um, please give us your questions. We have one question already. I'll, we'll come to that a bit later. Uh, but please put your uh, questions in the chat box. Um, and, and now I'd like to go for the second question we have prepared for the audience. 
uh, and it's about what sort of lab tests uh, are you doing or have you been doing? So what type of lab test uh, have you done? Uh, there are a couple of topics here. Uh, we're already seeing uh, uh, the run-up and, and oh wow, that's, that's interesting. It's a totally different uh, trend. We had a previous LinkedIn uh, uh, run that we did. There, there the results were a bit different. What, uh, what do we see here? The number one test result, uh, tests that were taken uh, are blood tests from the executive health screening. The second uh, uh, most prevalent are then COVID-19 tests. Honestly, I would have thought these are much, much more, uh, which basically means this whole notion around melt-off is not maybe happening as, as we would expect. Ashok, any, any thoughts? Well, just, just in terms of numbers, we did over 45 million tests across the three labs, not including SRL, so Singapore, Malaysia, and, and Turkey in 2021. And COVID tests were, you know, somewhere around four to five million. So the the other tests are still very large in number. So I think this is this is not this is not a surprising sort of outcome from from what we're seeing from the audience. Which means that you do see a very very solid base business that is there and is growing. Yeah, absolutely. So I think coming back to some of the points that were raised by Daniel and also from an investor like uh, BlackRock and Mike. It, it, it is pretty clear that trust, reliability are key factors. That is what drives the doctors and patients to choose a certain laboratory. And I think the, the trend is what we're also seeing is that the key themes that we need to deliver as a laboratory services operator, accessibility, very, very important. Like more accessible you make uh, the lab testing, uh, the faster it is to grow the business. Obviously, what also matters is your, your, your test menu. Expansion of test menu, going to the higher end, more esoteric test means you're able to partner better with the doctors and have that kind of a trust, greater trust build with doctors and, and patients. And I think these are the three core sort of values that we are following as well. Like trust, reliability, and and making sure that you know we are uh, essentially able to provide convenience to our doctors and our, and our patients, and I think that's the basis on which we are going to build. We are building our strategy, and 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 the key focus for us is basically grow our core business. And you know, one of one of the obvious things to ask us to ask me would be, okay, but you know, where does the growth come from? And our trend is pretty clear. That yes, we have a large part of our growth coming from our hospitals, which is the obvious sort of case. But we now have a big focus on our outreach business, which are the, the specialists, the independent GPs. And that's the segment we are really focused on. And that's where we think the growth is going to come from going forward. So just on that, so, so what's the split between captive market, IHH hospitals, and outreach today? I think it, it differs from market to market. It's sort of different in Singapore, different in Malaysia, different in Turkey. But I think what, what we're seeing now as, as a trend is uh, in a 30, 40 percent of our business is coming from outside our own hospitals. Yes, to some extent, it is led by by COVID, but I think this is slowly moving from from uh, business coming purely from hospitals to to outside, and and I think that's where. We as operators uh, are, are focusing and, and spending our energy also in because while we want to grow our businesses outside a hospital, what's, what's then critical is efficiency. How quickly can we turn around our tests? Digitalization. How do we make sure that you know, we are making our services more accessible? How, 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 how are we making sure that we, we're going back with the test results quickly in a digital sort of a format? And, and partnerships, how are we partnering with, with pharma companies and other you know, uh, uh, new innovative you know, companies to expand our services. So, so that's, that's how the, the, the laboratory business is, is slowly shifting, especially for IHH, from, uh, from our own hospitals, which will still remain 
very, very important and key to us to outside our hospitals into the whole outreach specialists and, and GPs. And I think over a period of time, what we really want to do is start reaching directly to the patient and our consumers as well. Look, sounds, sounds super interesting. And so if I just share with the audience, we have a project running in the company. We call it Project Lightyear. And, and that talks about speed and it talks about change. So, so what do we need to do to really transform this into its own, into its own role? I think like, like the work that has been done by... And, and by the way, you lead Project Lightyear. <laughs> but I think it's, it's the work that has been done by the teams. It's the work in our teams in Singapore, Malaysia, Turkey, and India. They have been they have actually been key to the success of the business so far, and that's how, that's our key sort of tool as we sort of grow our business. To me, people and the strength of our bench, our leadership, and our teams is what will define us as we grow our business over the next five years. Second, very importantly, as mentioned, how do we expand our, our tests? How do we get into more higher-end tests? How do we deliver better solutions to our doctors and ultimately our patients is also going to be key. And, and I think in, in all of this, what is also quite central is our, our technology. IHH is a leader in healthcare services. We are leaders in, in our lab services, but we will be leaders in technology as well. So our lab information systems, our reagent management systems, our ability to digitalize our platform front to back and, and back to front and ultimately use the information that we have, the data that we have effectively is what is going to define our future and also you know, ensure that we maintain our market leadership you know, as, as our business groups. I, I always like it when you talk about market leadership. That, that sounds like... Uh something to aspire to, but, but we are already the market leader in, in many of the markets we are, we are in. One of the questions here was uh, from Daniel Koh, um, what, what are the growth targets for the IHH diagnostic segment in the medium term? Can you give us a flavor? So I think, let, let, let me talk a little bit about the sector. And I think, I, I believe the sector is going to grow at somewhere between 15 to 20% over the next five years. That is pretty solid growth. But even more interesting, this is a sector which is uh, profitable. The profitability in the sector is high, and the return on equity is, is somewhere between mid to high teens. And I think that's where our targets will also be. We want to be, we want to grow, but we want to grow while maintaining profitability. Another question that, that also comes from Daniel Kohl, and maybe Harif, this is, this is something for you. How do you stay, you talked about the forefront of technology, how do you stay there? How do you remain the technology leader in laboratories operations? Interesting. Uh, yes, uh, Panta Premier has always been uh, embracing technology. Uh, we have this... Uh, well, I call the three A uh, uh, strategy: adopt, adapt, and advance. Um, and the whole idea behind adopting technology is to make uh, the service, like what uh, Ashok mentioned earlier, accessible and affordable locally. And it must be effective and also efficient. Um, so, how do I do that? Is uh, one of the area that we pride ourselves is that we allow our people to upscale their uh, capability and uh, their know-how. Um, training for us is number one. Uh, we ensure that uh, our scientists are always being sent for training uh, wherever possible and whenever there is opportunity. We empower our people to innovate um, and even attract talent to join us. Um, in fact, uh, last year we came up with some innovation uh, whereby we uh, 
are working closely with some partners uh, to come up with uh, ideas on how we can um, improve our service delivery. Um, and also, like what Ashok mentioned and even Daniel uh, alluded to, um, service delivery is also very important. Uh, and that is why uh, this year we are embarking into what we call a, a digitalization transformation project. We call the project Tuntas. Tuntas is, is a Malay word, <laughs> I mean, uh, to complete. Uh, uh, and we are going to digitalize our service delivery component to make it seamless and compelling to the consumer. Uh, so those are the few steps that uh, we are doing. And of course, importantly, we want to have a dynamic partnership not only with vendors or pharmaceutical, even with our hospitals. Uh, we see our consultants as our uh, valuable partners, whereby we have constant dialogue with them on how to improve the service deliveries uh, to the patients. At the end of the day, uh, our goal is common. We want to save life. We want to transform care and improve outcomes uh, for, for the patients. Okay, great. It seems uh, uh, developing our own people, bringing in uh, new experts, investing into uh, the right frontier technologies are things that, that we are planning. But then let's go back to Daniel and, and bring this together, what Michael said, uh, around data analytics, data trends. And Daniel, you mentioned that as well as something you find a real differentiator. Do you have these capabilities or how do you develop these capabilities? Well, the data story is actually quite complex um, for several reasons. One is you do need structured data. And when I say structured data, it means that it is a data set that you can actually transpose to different other, I mean, to other different laboratories. And the commonality of it is that many laboratories do not use the same platforms. So the results that you're getting from one, res from one laboratory needs to be able to translate or transpose to another result from another laboratory. So what we are trying to do in, in the whole of IHH laboratories across the, the network is to create this structured data set. In other words, it is like a currency exchange. It's really quite plainly, right? It's similar to, if I was to use a better word, the euro, right? So the euro is a common currency used across many different current countries. So in the same way that structured data set that we're talking about is your lab results, that you find in one patient in one country can be easily interpreted in another jurisdiction. So in other words, you can bring your results across your, your doctors, across different geographies, and they'll be able to read the same data. That means they'll be able to say that you've got high cholesterol, there's no question about it. It's not because the unit of measurements are different, etc. So that's one component of structured data. The structured data part is also linked to demographic information. In other words, you know, is this lab result from a Chinese male 50 year old or is it from a female who's 20 years old? Because obviously results differ as you age. And of course, there are certain differences in ethnicity as well based on uh, your genetic makeup. So again, a certain uh, normal reference range could be considered abnormal uh, in a certain different population. So that's what we're trying to get to in terms of getting, making sure that your lab results are normal for your particular phenotype, in other words, for your particular genetic makeup. And that's something that is not translatable at the moment because when, we, when you get your lab results, let's say for health screening, is your, your doctor says you've got high cholesterol, but is it really because it's high cholesterol for your population or for you itself. So moving forward, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get all this standardized. And once we get the standardized data set, it is very easy to translate it. And that becomes very useful, particularly for payers, because we know that in many markets, including Singapore, we have government payers. And payers will obviously want to know what am I paying for? If I'm going to subsidize this particular test, 
with that, what am I going to get back in return? So whether it is a public payer like the government or private payers like insurers, they would like to get the labs basically to tell them, what are you giving me? So that I'll be able to make better use of this in terms of doing some data analytics to give perhaps in the, the holy grail of what we're trying to get through, which is predictive analytics. So using myself example, 50 year old Chinese male, you know, slightly overweight with you know cholesterol problems. Am I going to be a target for getting a coronary heart disease in a couple of years' time if my cholesterol keeps going on this trend? And so it, that's where the data analytics will come back to so I'll say, I may be a risk factor or I may not be a risk factor because of the trending of my lab results. So putting all this bucket together is actually very important for all of us. And I think that's really the future of the lab diagnostic market moving forward. Great, Daniel. That, that's, that's very insightful. I think it also depends on uh, our ability to attract talent to help us on this data journey. This is certainly not something that's easily done. And, and I guess, uh, Ashok, are you planning to set up a data team or hiring data scientists? Or, or how do you do that? So I think we are, first and foremost, we, we are definitely looking to enhance capabilities in, in the area of uh, data sciences and technology. So we have, we have recently made a hire uh, to uh, for someone highly qualified to join us as the CIO for our labs business for the group. And I think the next step will be then to have more in-house capabilities on, on the data side. But, but I, what I also think is important is partnerships and collaborations because we are, we are now in, in a uh, easily able to do part of the work internally but also then go and, and partner with people who are specialized uh, in this area and that can be done two ways one is just a partnership and this the second area would be us taking uh, or us making minority investments in some of these platforms now, one of the things that we've done within IHH is we, ha we have gone and made investments into health tech companies, series A, uh, series A are very early, early stage investments. And I think that's something that I would certainly look at when it comes to more specialized area like data sciences as well to see if we can truly get expertise from outside within to, to, and migrate that within our own sort of platform. Sounds interesting. Minority investment sounds a little bit like corporate venture capital and some thoughts around that. I, I think we'll, we're going to talk about that. Um, one of the things you mentioned, Ashok, uh, is number of locations, uh, collection centers, uh, and it, it ties back to this growth element. So maybe, Harif, how, I mean, you have a, you, you run a, a, in a large country, uh, you have how many locations, and if you think about growing the number of locations, how would you do that? Well, currently, uh, Pantai Premier, we have altogether 30 labs uh, throughout, across the nations. Mm. 16 of these labs are hospital-based, uh, and we also have some hospital-based lab, lab that are outside from the IH group. Um, yes, we are planning to expand geographically uh, at some strategic locations where uh, the IH group of hospitals are not present. But uh, when we talk about expansion, we also talk about uh, capability, uh, technical expansions. Uh, currently, we are number one in pathology, uh, in diagnostic testing. Uh, and we are asking ourselves, shall we go further than that? Uh, perhaps do analytical testing, uh, maybe veterinary testing or food science. So those are the areas we think that uh, we should look at as well as we grow. So it's not only expanding geographically, but also expanding our capability. So if, you, if, you, if I would ask you, you have 30 locations now, uh, let's say you want to you wanna add five more or ten more in, in Malaysia. How much, look, how much dollars for, for one additional location? I mean, if you want to open one, how, how much would that, how much, how much would be the damage? Uh, 
again, um, yeah, for a small lab, uh, it can cost us not much, actually, frankly. But then uh, it also depends on uh, what kind of expertise do, do you want these labs to be. Uh, giving you an example, uh, we are currently uh, upgrading our reference specialized lab in Kuala Lumpur and, and ballpark figure we are spending around five million um, sing dollar uh, for, for the expansion. But if we are looking at uh, a routine bread and butter lab services, um, less than a million uh, should be sufficient for, for the infrastructure. But that that doesn't that doesn't sound like a like a lot of investment to start and expand a business. I, I, I'm, I'm the CFO of the company, so I look at capital returns. What what are ROSI and and capital return numbers, Ashok, in in your business? So I think our ROSI numbers will be well above twenty uh, percent. Uh, like like you said, you know, the capital investment is not significant. Uh, once you have you're, you're established as a trusted uh, brand and, and, and people believe in your services, high level of reliability, expansion is, is not that, that, we don't need that kind of capital. Plus the margins of the business are, are high, um, in, in most cases at par or higher than what, what you normally get from, from hospitals. So therefore the cash flows of this business are actually very, very strong. I guess where you need the capital and where we're going to come to you, you know, at some stage is when we want to do some M&A. Okay. That's where, that's, I think that's where, apart from the organic journey, organic growth journey, we're going to have, that there may be some opportunities available going forward, which may require additional capital. Let, let, let me take that and, and ask Michael uh, on that. It, it doesn't seem that there is a lot of money required for organic expansion and, and growing the number of outlets. Um, so I assume that type of money is available. Uh, but then we also look at M&A questions. We look at capital market valuations. And there we talk about entirely different type of valuations. Where, where do you see uh, valuations headed? I'm, I'm referencing India, for example. Uh, and is that type of money available to get deals done? So I would say we need to separate out the public markets and the private markets. I think the public markets have just been through the biggest month ever in growth, the value rotation. Um, so if you look at obviously what's happened in, in sectors, high growth, such as the tech space, you've seen this enormous sell off globally and value has really, has really spiked. But I think what's fascinating to see is you're quite a big difference between the public sector and the private sector. So if you look at the private equity space, there is a huge amount of capital that's been raised in the billions, uh, if not in the trillions, um, where whole new, new entrants to the private equity space have now entered all the way from venture capital all the way through to late stage private equity. And so what that means is then those investors are all hungry for high growth opportunities um, where they're going to be able to see a, a um, new or a new business model or opportunity in, a, in an established sector that will now enable them to get exposure. And so when we talk about what we've been discussing today of digitizing what has been a highly fragmented business in labs into an ecosystem with, with extensive, um, extensive use of technology, that ticks a lot of boxes within that private equity, uh, for that private equity capital. And so I think it's really important to understand the difference because we're we're now in a we're now at a point where the private private markets are at times even bigger sources of capital than the public markets, which has not really happened before. And as I think about my time in Asia in the last ten years, um, there is a real global investor desire to get more Asia exposure, and you're actually seeing in certain cases, and you call out India you've had more capital almost flowing into private markets in India that you have had in public markets in India. And so I think that that means that for companies such as IHH and, and others, there's now actually a bigger choice of um, sources of capital, depending on the strategy one is trying to employ. But even look at, if I take you on in these valuations and, and let's look at India again, I mean, look, you have some companies where, where they traded 30, 30x EBITDA. 
um, some higher. I mean, I've I've done DCF models in my time, and you, you can't even have enough columns to to get to a positive net present value once you have such multiples. How do you justify that? Is the is the growth potential just as so seen as so big, or is there something else happening that you see? Yes, these valuations are justified. Well, I think on India specifically, there's a broader broader point that India actually looks in one of the best positions it's been for a while. Um, and so I think you've always had traditionally in the equity markets, high valuations driven by uh, retail and local mutual funds. What's been interesting to see, I think, in the last year is it hasn't been driven by a large flow of international money into India. It's really been domestic anticipation like up until kind of the end of the year in January. India was the strongest performing stock, one of the strongest performing markets globally. And that's really being driven domestically by this excitement on the opportunity set. You've seen uh, from an RBI perspective, on the one hand, look stronger. You've seen from the growing growth of the middle classes, you've seen that growing stronger. You've seen the proliferation of technology across society growing stronger. And so therefore, these factors are driving a lot of, I think, the, the, the beta of the Indian market. Um, and particularly when you there is so much excitement around the unicorns that have been created in the last 10 years coming to the market, it's all exacerbating these high valuations that we're seeing versus other other countries, which is quite unique to to other markets where you saw more normalized valuations between um, maybe more developed markets such as the US and, and other countries in Asia Pacific. Let me go to some of the questions uh, that uh, we have here and, and everyone, uh, just to remind the audience, uh, please do type in your questions uh, uh, into this. Let me uh, go through some of them. Uh, one of the questions is around um, competitiveness with the growing of commercial laboratories. Uh, how is IHH competing with them? And, and there are a couple of names mentioned, Pathology Asia, Gribbles, others. Ashok, maybe I, I, I guide that to you. How, how, do you. how do we stay competitive? Well, I, I guess it, it, the most important sort of factor for us is, is, is making sure that we, we are delivering what our, what our patients and our clients want. Uh, at a price point which is affordable uh, and in an effective and efficient sort of manner. That's the that's that's the most sort of important and, and critical thing. Our, our tests we already are highly reliable and we're highly trustworthy. And now it's the process that that sort of will differentiate how how we sort of optimize what we have. In addition, it comes down to our marketing strategy. How do we then make sure that we're capturing the additional market share from some of the competitors that have been mentioned here? And that's a combination of our, our, our front end sales team and then what we do in terms of our, our delivery platforms and our digitalization platforms and our lab information services that will make it easier for the GPs and the specialists in terms of you know, delivering this end results to the patients. So it's, it's a combination of these factors and I think we follow what our competitors are doing very closely uh, on every aspect of the uh, of of our operations, and I think I, I love to hear some views from uh, Daniel and Harif as well as to specifically how they uh, how how they have sort of tackled our key, our key competitors in the two markets. So, Pathology Asia, that's uh, going to uh, uh, Malaysia, I guess. The question and Singapore. Harif, how, how do you how do you stay competitive? How, how do you fend off some of these who want to encroach on your territory? Uh, thank you, John. Uh, I, I will not dwell so much on pathology Asia, but more on our strength. Uh, you see, one of our strength and success factor is that uh, of our deep understanding of patient care requirements and our role as a vital component of that ecosystem that add value and add significant clinical value. I'll give you an example. Uh, in the hospitals that where we are uh, providing services, especially not only in our IH hospitals, um, the lab is very much involved in 
the various committees uh, and policy making when it comes to improving care. Uh, we are involved uh, in the tumor board meeting. Uh, we give suggestions uh, and recommendations on their transfusion and blood bank services and policies. Uh, we are very much involved in the, uh, the hospital infectious control and antimicrobial stewardship, to name a few. And we are also committed uh, to ensure the quality requirements and systems are in place in the labs where the hospitals are, be it uh, the requirement by MSQH, JCI, as well as uh, the local CCAP requirements. So uh, our relationship and effective communication with the clinicians in developing services, like I mentioned earlier, uh, through joint initiatives like uh, value-driven outcome projects, clinical improvement initiatives and introduction of new modalities and clinical practice guidelines are uh, very much important and dear to us. And I think these are our strengths that make us above uh, the other competitors who are purely commercial-based commercial labs. Like I mentioned earlier, we are there in the entire continuum of healthcare from womb to tomb, you know, be it in screening for wellness, predicting risk assessment, assisting in making diagnosis, helping in making decisions to choose what treatment to use, prognosis, monitoring treatment, effectiveness, post-treatment monitoring, and even to understand the cause of death. So for that, we are prepared to create a lab that can expand its capability and optimize it, its utilization. So that is our commitment. And, and I think uh, with that, uh, we can be above uh, water and uh, I'm quite positive that um, we are uh, at a blue ocean stage when it comes to the competitors uh, in Malaysia. Okay, that, that sounds, that sounds uh, uh, like some others have to wear warm gloves uh, uh, to prepare for the competition that's coming. Expansion of capabilities, absolute trust in our services. And, and building of sales forces and not just waiting for the next uh, uh, blood sample to come in, but really acquiring doctor relationships and others. That, that, sounds, that sounds great. Synergies is one of the questions that comes, and maybe Daniel, you can share with us a little bit. How is IHH capitalizing on the global platform between uh, uh, the various geographies uh, uh, that we are operating in? So what are the synergies we can draw from this? So with respect to synergies, we're talking about IHH as a global network. And one of the things that we can do very well is to have common platforms. In other words, like what I mentioned earlier, if we have the same analyzers that are running the same kind of tests in different countries, then these results can be sort of interchangeable and they can be easily translated. The other synergies are obviously with respect to economies of scale, and that perhaps can answer your previous question about how do we sort of fend off the competition that's knocking on our doors, which is there's always price competition, and that's going to be inevitable. It's an open market. So we don't want to be fighting to the bottom of the barrel for the cheapest price tests, you know, with the lowest quality. I think from the consumer, or i.e. The, the clinicians, or the doctors, or the patients, the ideal world is to pay the lowest price with the highest quality tests. And that's what we are trying to make sure that we can offer to all our patients with it. So bring this combined synergy of terms of economies of scale that we can do global procurement as an IHH group, we can actually help drive some of the prices down, and then we can pass on these savings back to the clinicians and also ultimately to the patients itself. The third component about the synergy part is actually what, we, what Harry shared, that we don't have to be the domain expert in all fields. <coughs> Granted that we have strengths in Turkey, we have strengths in Malaysia, like Harry mentioned, they've got a very strong pathology service over there with a very big number of uh, histopathologists that can do uh, anatomical pathology slide interpretation. 
Same here in Singapore, we don't have as big a workforce, but then we can actually share and leverage on the expertise that they have across the different geographies. The beauty of it is that because we all exist in different geographies, our disease pathology is very different. And that's where the synergy comes in because a disease that's not so common with us may be common in a different territory. And that's where if you have the experts there, be it microbiologists or pathologists who see more of that pathology, we are able to sort of get these results or these samples interpreted by the best experts in that field in that particular domain. So we we'll see that as a whole network effect for IHH laboratories, we can actually build up this synergy in terms of expertise, cross-sharing, of uh, consumables and analyzers in terms of getting region prices down and also translating back into good back to our patients. Excellent, great. And, uh, and you know, if sorry. I can just add, you know, what in, in addition to what Daniel and Harif said, so we have our lab information system, TELUS, which has been implemented in, in LabMed and which is now being rolled over in, in Malaysia and then is going to be rolled over in, in Singapore. So this is one very good example how expertise is going to migrate from one geography to the other uh, with the, uh, and a common team which is going to do this. And this is just one example and in, in addition to all the other examples that were provided by Harif and, and, and Daniel. And I think this is an absolute strength that we have compared to our competitors. And you have yeah. some of the experts from Turkey, who cannot be with us today in this call, but you have some of the leading experts that are even here as delegates in Singapore to help you build a technology platform. No, absolutely. So I think we, we you know, people are, 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 are the best resource we have. And the team from Turkey will be in Malaysia soon. We have in, in our own team, uh, Professor uh, Ibrahim, uh, who's, 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 who's a specialist, who's been the CEO of of LabMed earlier, and he's he's a chief uh, medical sort of officer, working closely with uh, Harif and Daniel as we sort of think about our, our lab tests and our lab menus and improving our own sort of uh, you know medical practices within our labs. So I think this whole our, our ability to use the expertise we have in Turkey, Singapore, Malaysia, and India is absolutely unique compared to any other platform that's out there. And I understand Anand from uh, SRL. Uh, is also gradually joining into this platform of sharing and, and contributing. Yes. Great, fantastic. One of the questions here, I, I, I leaked uh, the information about uh, a Project Lightyear, and of course now people come and ask, what is Project Lightyear? Ashok. So I think uh, Project Lightyear is just, we want to basically create a global laboratories platform. That's our vision, and uh, what we what what we're putting together is the various uh, businesses which were which were once integrated within a hospitals, segregating segregating them out and putting them in one business platform, and our plan is basically to create a a, a laboratories business which will be you know a leading platform on a global basis. And you will hear uh, uh, from us uh, starting Q1 uh, some changes in our segment disclosures uh, around uh, the laboratories business. So I think we will share a little bit more going forward. Question here from Daniel Co again, how much CapEx uh, does IHH plan to spend uh, uh, on the digital transformation of the um, laboratories business? I think I can add here, we've already shared with you that we're going to spend north of 100 million US dollars in the overall IHH trans digital transformation journey over the next couple of years. Do you have any specific number in mind for how, what that is for labs? No, I think uh, no more sort of details right now. I think our, 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 what we need as part of the overall plans that you just sort of mentioned for IHH, uh, a, a small proportion. So one question comes, do we need to fundamentally look at the lab business differently? Okay, hold on, I need to read here. Differently, for example, as a retail brand business, as a B2C 
uh, to generate that pull through across all digital channels to drive that trust that you talked about, Ashok. So do you see that this lab business really has different drivers and much more consumer drivers to it uh, uh, than what we see in other parts of our business? Oh, it, it certainly does, although our, our businesses in Singapore, Malaysia, and Turkey are still largely B2B. It's, in India, it's, it's mostly B2C. So that's how the, the three, uh, the four markets are different from each other. But I think, like I said, the, the trend that I see over the next five years is more and more people uh, taking more interest in their own health and therefore us connecting to them more closely is, is definitely a trend that's going to happen. Let us go back, uh, uh, Michael, uh, again, you talked a little bit about the healthcare space, how you see it. Uh, maybe towards the end of this session, tell us again, what do you find attractive in this industry? Uh, and you spoke, used the word unicorn twice in, in, uh, in this session. Who's, what's, who's the next unicorn? <laughs> um, so I think what we think about healthcare is that we're seeing the transformation that we've seen in other sectors taking place. So I think I mentioned this earlier in the breadth of opportunity being driven by some of the technology changes happening in both from a scientific perspective and also in the in the way consumers and corporates uh, are cons uh, kind of are engaged with healthcare. And so I think what we are looking at is how do you capture those trends? And I think that. Uh, we haven't touched on it as much, but I, we, we've spent a lot of time on this change around insurance and, and the changes in health insurance. Um, many of us now, for example, and I see Ashok's got one on today, having an Apple Watch on, uh, tracking all of our daily movements and steps. And this is when you think about that collection of data paired with the changes that Daniel and Harif were talking about of the change of data on the lab side, you start bringing those two together the opportunities within healthcare and how that's going to change um, across multiple segments from an insurance perspective, from a labs perspective, from e-pharmacy or from pharmacy, sorry, and then from hospitals as well is, is really exciting. And I think that healthcare is in an interesting space because you're able to learn what's happened, see what's happened in other sectors, kind of take some of those best practices or best pieces of technology, as, as Ashok mentioned, and either through adoption or through partnership really harness them to deliver different deliver growth in a different way to the healthcare sector that hasn't been there traditionally. Um, and I think that's what we think is really exciting. From a unicorn perspective, I still think that there's a huge amount to come in uh, online medicine. Um, so I think the changes in behavior we've seen through COVID, uh, those companies that can capture those changes, consumer behavior and how they interact with healthcare, from pharmacy to GP consultation to diagnostics, there's a massive opportunity there. And I think that that's where we'll probably see the, this range of unicorns come through um, this layer. But I think when you look beyond that um, uh, into the different areas of the value chain, um, we really think that this can be particularly exciting. Um, and when you add in uh, key factors, such as obviously the focus on ESG at the moment, uh, particularly around social, and the role that health plays in social and the ability to make healthcare more available to others with technology, um, with improvements in processes, etc. You're going to see this desire for really in the same way you've already seen probably in the ed tech sector, where you see ed tech or education technology investment really skyrocket. I think there's you've seen healthcare coming up behind. Um, and I think that that's only going to be a continuing trend given the, the changing assessment that many investors are making beyond just financial return they're looking at how does it have the environmental social or governance impact that they're also looking to achieve with their investments so what i'm he hearing is that the, that you see a lot of consumerization happening the end consumer or we in some cases a patient but it can be a subscriber uh, to a service uh, uh, coming here at play. There's one question that addresses exactly that, and that's this home use uh, uh, point of care uh, uh, topic. Do we develop or do you see this home use point of care product or service becoming more popular 
Uh, and does the laboratory business have an impact uh, on that, Ashok? What, what is your thought? I, I do think that this this will this will certainly sort of increase. I think that this trend has been is well said and is here to say. Uh, how it impacts the the laboratory business, I think, to some extent, this is going to be you know only going to have a positive impact in terms of growth in our business. So that's the way I look at this. But it does mean, and, and maybe Daniel, you can help us here, that there is a trend towards more B2C consumer driven uh, uh, approach and how can we speak to consumers or patients directly. For example, here in Singapore, that's not that easy yet. Do you no, have any in, in Singapore, we are bound by the healthcare regulations, which does not uh, allow B to C uh, consumerism of uh, diagnostic tests. It still has to go through the medical practitioner as the intermediary to be the curator of all uh, these diagnostic tests. And it's ultimately the legal liability of who holds the responsibility for the, the treatment of care for the patient itself. Point of care is going to come in, in a form that we'll probably have to embrace it. Uh, it may not be in the traditional mode that we are operating in with you know, big, huge machines. It may come into smaller units that can be probably done at home, but it will have to be done under supervision, uh, which will be still your medical practitioner. But having said that, it does offer a new opportunity and that opportunity comes in the form of getting real-time information as to your health status like what I mentioned at the very beginning that your health status is really a snapshot of what you have and what these home or home care or point of care devices will give you is actually a real-time um, cumulative uh, movie if I was to use the word, it's a movie now. It's no longer a photo frame of your health. So from the patient themselves, if all this is translated to an app and it's like you playing your, your Apple phone movie, you can actually see the background of what's happening. And similar to your own health, you can actually see the background of how your diabetes is uh, progressing. Vice versa, like the example I talked about, your cholesterol, you know, how is it evolving on a day-to-day -day basis as compared to doing it every three months? And you just see one number to it. <clears throat> and based on that number, your doctor decides to either increase or decrease your medication. Well, right now, I think if we have that sort of real-time information, then it actually gives us a better view and this allows a lot of remote medicine uh, telemonitoring from your physician to give you the most up-to-date treatment uh, schedules that needs to, to happen for you to better manage your, your health. And that's actually what patient empowerment is all about, that patients want to be able to control their destiny, which is really, do I need to take this pill today or can I skip this pill? with it. So I guess that's where I, I would say that if I was to put, look into the crystal ball, this is probably how the new care model is going to evolve over the next couple of years. And, and what you're basically saying is we do need the regulator to help us maybe ease some of these transactions uh, with patients, subscribers or customers, uh, uh, while at the same time we need to stay close to the doctor community maybe general practitioners even, uh, to build out that service platform uh, for patients and to get into that patient empowerment or this more patient-centric thinking. There's one question here, and, and I'll, 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 I'll uh, pass that question to, uh, to basically Ashok as the head of strategy. Uh, what, what are IHH's thoughts on he asset heavy an asset light model. What's the way forward? So I think the way I look at uh, investments, it's it's sort of a matrix. Uh, we've got uh, our hospital segment, and we've got our our diagnostic segment, 
and we got some limited investment we made in, in healthcare, in health tech. And then we have um, our, our geographies, our, our core markets. So I think the principle remains the same. And we would focus in our core markets to grow our market position when it comes to and consolidate our market position when it comes to hospitals and labs. And while we look for any investment opportunity, it must enhance shareholder value. So creative opportunities, both on the hospital side, which are more capital uh, intensive, plus on the, on the lab side, uh, are, are both going to be looked at. I, I don't think we have a strong preference either ways. Uh, but it, it's, it's very clear to me that given how strong uh, we are in terms of our own cash flow position, we are well positioned today to think about these and evaluate opportunities which will benefit us over the medium to long term. I guess I would probably add to that, and not as a moderator here, but as the CFO of the business, I think there is a shift in investment profile and CapEx profile uh, of the business. I don't think we want to withdraw money from our uh, hospital operations, mm -hmm. but I think we do want to shift in our overall balance much more towards uh, high ROSI businesses uh, and well, which basically means lower capex types of businesses. You will see a lot more activities in, in that space. There's one question coming here. It's a bit of a, a, a question around and maybe Harif, you can help us answer that. All these lab thingies and fancy tests and all of this uh, makes the whole healthcare space more expensive. Does that mean that prices go up for the consumer, or for the patients, or, or what does that mean? Is, is all that needed, uh, or is there a value add for the patient to say, yes, it's, it's worth investing there? Well, this is very difficult. <laughs> uh, basically, uh, Our role is first to create awareness, then to make it accessible and to make it affordable. Uh, will this new test be a uh, high price? I, I will look at it out uh, what is really needed. So I go back to um, the oncology a space where we first started our companion diagnostic testing. Yeah. Um, in the olden days, uh, whenever you have cancer, patient just go for chemotherapy. And, and we know uh, chemotherapy is not really the ideal uh, solution for, for cancer. But now we have a lot of other options, um, targeted therapy, immunotherapy, companion, uh, precision medicine testing, uh, uh, therapy, but all these require precision testing. And currently the technology is very limited. That is why the price is very high. So when we come into the picture, we try to bring down the price. Uh, and I think currently the price is quite significantly lower as compared to maybe 10 years ago. Uh, and, and that is what we are trying to do. We create the awareness uh, of the availability of uh, such options, and then we make it accessible locally by making sure that we are able to run it in-house. Um, and we look for partners to bring down the price to make it affordable. So when you talk about costing and pricing, uh, I think we should also relate to value. Um, and I hope I answered that question. A very, very interesting lead back to saying, yes, maybe testing becomes more expensive, but in the overall bill for the patient uh, uh, is actually going down because through early, early detection, through prevention, through much more wellness focus, the overall healthcare spending is actually positively affected, even though testing or even though there may be more money spent on testing and on diagnostics. 
look, Ashok, um, and and we're gonna we're gonna round this up slowly. You you work for a bank that is very close to uh, where I grew up, Germany, uh, and you've been a managing director in investment banking for many many years. You're a seasoned investment professional, and now you joined IHH as uh, the head of strategy and and the head of this light year project. T t tell me a little bit about that. So uh, it's it's been a long association with IHH. I started working 2010, 2011. I was one of the lead uh, uh, bankers in the IPO uh, that happened in 2012. So it's it's an association that goes back 10 years. I've been involved in multiple transactions uh, for IHH and some of the shareholders uh, over the last 10 years. And, and I, I think uh, there was a point of time where the thought was coming to my mind was it what is the next step? And an inter uh, in my own sort of career, and an interesting opportunity came up where this role came from IHH, and, uh, uh, and I thought, yeah, this will be, this will be a good fit. I've, I've admired this company uh, from outside, been closely associated. Uh, let, me, let me go and see what I can do, what kind of value add I can provide uh, from the inside. And I, I was given you know, uh, uh, the most sort of warm welcome by everyone within IHH uh, to get me up and going and get me started. And I think, uh, I think it's been a fantastic last eight months in, in IHH, so much learning, uh, um, such good colleagues to work with. And I think an opportunity to actually, you know, work with uh, some of the leaders in the sector to actually, you know, take the organization, you know, and be part of a journey to take the organization to the next level. One of the questions here from the audience is: Are, are we going to see transactions? Are we going to see more acquisitions in in this space, the laboratory space, or or maybe even in the broader space? So I think growth is an important aspect for for IHH. And both organic growth and inorganic growth. I think it's critical for us uh, to deliver profitable growth. So I think what's, like I mentioned earlier as well, that we continue to evaluate opportunities both in the lab sector as well as the hospital space. And each opportunity needs to, to essentially meet our requirement in terms of uh, uh, returns, in terms of ROCI, and, and strategic fit to you know, our, our existing sort of businesses. So uh, I'm also hoping that we can, we can deliver the growth, but through a combination of organic and in, inorganic or sort of M&A transactions over the next five years. When you think about this laboratories business and, and you look at fast forward three years, five years from now, what what do you see in terms of value contribution or size contribution uh, to an IHH overall portfolio? Do you see this laboratory's business contribute more than what it does now, and, and where, where could that grow to? Well, I, I certainly hope that the contribution is significantly more than what it is today, because like I said, I, I, I think the sector is poised for a 15 to 20% growth over the next five years. And, and if we are, if we if we maintain our leadership position, we should be able to capture the growth. The the margins are attractive in the business, and so are the returns, both ROE and ROCE. So I think on all the matrices, growth, EBITDA margin, and returns, I think the contribution should definitely go up uh, in the next five years. And we are already the market leader in uh, in several markets, so that gives us a head start. To Absolutely. So I, I think it, it's, it's more a question of, we are now present in four markets, how do we consolidate our position in these markets and, and hopefully you know, add some new markets in our growth journey. We have uh, a couple of questions that remain uh, uh, unanswered at this stage. Uh, Farhan, Vari, you asked what are the game cha changes in the next 10 years in this healthcare business, I think we should 
schedule a dedicated healthcare insider for that to really talk a little bit more about long-term trends. Maybe we can bring in a couple of outside analysts and, and uh, yeah, gurus, healthcare gurus to talk about this. So sorry for deferring that to the next session. Um, and uh, look, we are uh, coming towards the end of this uh, uh, session. I want to thank everybody for tuning in uh, to this session. Uh, Michael, thanks for joining uh, from Hong Kong. Uh, Harif, thanks for joining from KL. Daniel, you're going to come back when? Tomorrow. <laughs> flying back tomorrow. You're flying back tomorrow? Okay, f fantastic. Uh, and if uh, your PCR test doesn't come in six hours, then uh, <laughs> you know what that <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Ashok, for Thanks sitting so here, uh, uh, and, and we'll, we'll find another opportunity to talk about the long-term trends uh, in uh, the healthcare industry. Thanks a lot to the audience for all your great questions, and welcome to the number four session that we'll schedule the next uh, uh, couple of months. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.